getting in God's Word. Thank you guys for being here. It's good to see you guys this morning. Um, you know, we are beginning a brand new series, and, uh, and literally today is just laying the foundation for this. And so it's going to be a little bit different sometimes than how we normally do. Foundations are always different, right? It's a little bit more challenging, a little bit different, but they're vital. Without the foundation, you can't build the building. Thank you for those three or four amen. <laughs> You're in a building that has a foundation. Without a, without a foundation, these walls would not be standing. This roof would not be over your head. So thank God for the foundation, amen? amen. And the foundation of your house, your apartment complex, your townhouse, your condo, wherever you live, whatever you do, the foundation is critical. If the foundation is compromised, if the foundation is cracked, if the foundation is not built to the specifications that it's supposed to be, then what happens is the building is in jeopardy. In your life, God is building us, and, you know, we are his building. He's the master architect, and he's building and establishing in our life, and, and so uh, we're moving forward with that. We're excited about what God is, is always doing in our life, and, and today, as we talk about this series called Being Irresistible, how can we be irresistible in our faith, irresistible in our church, irresistible in how we reach our community, irresistible in allowing God to work in and through our life? Each one of the weeks that we're, we're so far, we plan for most of the weeks that we're going to be doing. There's a short video that we're going to be uh, doing right before. So just do me a favor, check this out. This is Jillian and, um, and Andy uh, Mackey. And uh, just kind of what they're talking about, that we're going to build this series after that. Hey, what's up, Oasis? We're the Mackeys. I'm Jill. And I'm Andy. We are so excited to be a part of this series. Over the next few weeks, we will journey to different places and spaces where our faith in Jesus will become irresistible. That being said, there are still plenty of areas we all need to grow in, and that's why we're doing this video. For instance, I had a situation where I was uh, in a conversation with some friends, and one of them had some, I guess, concerns or objections about God, where the other one seemed like she was searching, and I found myself at a loss for words, fearing I was going to offend somebody. So... Um, I kind of sugarcoated a couple things and didn't really say the right things. And when I came home, I felt like a failure. And I just really was replaying the conversation over and over. And then I asked my husband, you know, what would you have said? And I think we've all been in that situation before. And when she had, she had asked me that question, I, I gave her an answer of what I probably would have said in that situation. And then as I reflected back, I said, you know what? Maybe that wouldn't have been the best thing to say. Um, and I think we all want to address people's questions. I think we all want to uh, answer any objections about God, but is our faith irresistible? And, you know, do we understand that um, there are answers? Do we understand that it's not a blind faith? Do we understand that um, we are called to be bold and courageous? Um, so, um, you know, it is our prayer that through this series um, that, that God raises up a church that goes out into the, to their world around them, into their grocery stores, to the soccer fields, to their workplaces, to their neighborhoods, where our faith becomes irresistible, so irresistible that people cannot help but wonder where it comes from, and then they ask questions, and that we engage, and that we love on people in grace and in truth, and that we lead as many people as we can to the Lord, that the gospel will be spoken and preached in our neighborhoods, and in our homes, and in our schools. That's our prayer. Um, we hope you get as much out of the series as we've gotten and putting into the series, and uh, we know it's going to be a great series. God bless. We love you guys. Bye. Over the next few weeks, that's what we're going to be doing. How do we walk this faith out at work? How do you walk it out at school? How do you live it? How do you live a life that is irresistible when it comes to things of God? Because, you know, when you think about the early church, after Jesus ascended into heaven, he said, hey, now you guys, you go into all the world and preach the gospel. So he commissioned them to go out and, and to do that. And when you look at it, they did this under the pressure of Rome doing everything it can to stop them, to kill them, to annihilate them, to hunt them down. You know, Emperor Nero was like taking them, uh, Christians, and were dipping them in tar and using them as, using them as light poles to, to light up as torches in his garden while he entertained people. I mean, Christianity wasn't the thing you wanted to just say, hey, I want to be a Christian, right? It wasn't popular. It wasn't just a matter of not being popular. It was a matter of you may die as a result of your faith. But they had this irresistible faith in Christ that compelled them that no matter what they went through and what it was like, 
what the situations were, what the circumstances were that challenged them to go forward, to connect, and to live this out and walk this out. And they did. And what, you know, what's, so, what's incredible when you think about history-wise, and it, it's like here you had during this time period uh, of, of, of Jesus and, and the, the first century church, you know, Rome, the cross was a symbol of their power and their might. Uh, we mentioned, touched a little bit about this on our Easter service last week. It, you know, with the cross, it was, it was used for thieves, it was used for robbers, it was used for anyone that tried to do, create political upheaval or resistance against Rome. I mean, they would nail you to that thing, and, and they did it in such a way that they didn't want you just to, it wasn't supposed to be a painless death. It was supposed to be, let's see how long we can keep you alive while you're nailed to this thing so that you suffer every second. And that for every person that walks by that cross, when they look up and they say, man, I don't want to be that guy. It was a very good way for them to try to keep the controls upon the people by saying, this guy did this, this guy you know, was a horse thief, you don't want to steal horses, you'll be the next one up here. You want to you wanna talk against, against the government, okay, you know what, we're going to stick this guy up there, we're going to nail him there, you're going to watch him die every time you come back and forth from your house to go into the city to buy food or, or whatever, and you're walking, they put it right in the front wherever, they, they didn't hide it, they stuck it on the road. So when you walked by, they saw this because they wanted every person that walked by to say, you know what, I don't want to be that guy. So you know what, I'm going to be quiet, I'm going to be nice, I'm just going to just do whatever they say whenever they say, and say, you ju- say jump, I'll jump as high as you want me to, how high you want me to jump, I'll jump. <laughs> you know, that was what they were, the, the, a lot of what they did with that. And so they would, leave them, they would leave the bodies up there literally to the point where they were being picked apart by birds and animals and things like that. Just as a way of saying, of just drawing it out. And so anyways, this was, you think about it, this was the cross that, that was used by Rome to say the power they had. But isn't it so amazing that if you just fast forward a number of generations beyond that, that it went from being this thing they used as a way of torture and control to a message of, of, of Christ's death and resurrection and turned it completely around. I mean, that the cross today, if you, wear, I mean, if you have a cross on right now, you're not wearing it as a symbol of the power and the might of Rome to control the people. You're, you're wearing it as a symbol of Jesus Christ who's no longer on the cross, who was buried, he's alive and risen forevermore. And because of his death and resurrection on that cross, guess what? I have a, life, a new life in Christ. It's power, it's resurrection that's a part of that. So the cross is no longer that symbol of power and control, but of freedom and of liberty that we have through Jesus Christ. But that didn't just happen. That happened because of a group of people that had an irresistible faith in spite of all the torture, in spite of all the obstacles that came against them. And you know, and be honest, today... There are people today, pastors and churches and and Christians today, that are being persecuted, being put to death, being put in prison because of their faith. I mean, we are blessed to be in this country. Well, they made fun of me, and oh, whoop, 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 whoop de doo okay? You know, think about it. I mean, no one likes to be made fun of because you're a Christian or this kind of thing or whatever, but there are people literally in prison because they said, I love Jesus. Today. There are countries today where you can be put to death. Our people, whether by the government, but by your neighbors, by people in your neighborhood that say, okay, you're a Christian? Okay, well, we're going to take your, your son. And I had a, a, a pastor that I know in India. He and his wife, they took, and I've told this story before, they took the guy's son, just come back from college, because this pastor and his wife were preaching Jesus to the, the villages around that area. While they were out ministering, they took his son and they strung him up on a noose in the backyard. So when they walked back into their home, and there his son, their son was up there, just come back from college. They didn't even know he'd come back to visit his mom and dad. And there he was, hung up in the back, dead. And you know what they did? They turned back around. They, they, I mean, obviously they mourned. Obviously they were hurt. But they said, you know what? This is not going to stop our faith. And they moved forward. And they had the opportunity to sit there and talk to this, 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 the sister of the young man that died. Her and her husband, their brand new baby, and we said, well, what are you going to do? He says, we're about to go out to the mission field. We're going to be going out to this remote village in, in, in a very difficult state, that, this place in India, this, the state of Assam, and they were going out to go minister because they had an irresistible faith to follow Christ and to connect with people this message of Jesus Christ. How do you do that? You can't do it if you're wanting everything to be all comfy, comfy, but you can do it when you have a passion in your life 
to move forward and say, God, I want my life to be one that, that doesn't repel people from Jesus, doesn't make people resist Jesus, but it makes Jesus irresistible for their life. That they need this. They look and say, I need that. I, I need that in my life today. I loved hearing the, not in the midst of all the tragedy last Sunday in Sri Lanka with the churches and, and all the other people that were in the hotels and things that were murdered during this bomb attack, these, these terrorist attacks that took place. And one of the, the pastors of one of the churches, the priest, he stood up and he remember they interviewed him. He says, this will not stop our faith. This will not keep us from moving forward. See, that's that irresistible faith that in spite of all that we go through, that it compels us to go forward. And that's what the early church had. That's how they were able to do what they did. And for us today, we have to come to that point to be able to do the same thing. This series came as a, as a it was inspired. Not ba- it's not based upon the book, but inspired by a couple things that, that some of us uh, that were reading in this book called Irresistible by Andy Stanley. And it's a good book. There's some things I'm like, eh, you know, I'm not like totally sold on. But, but some of the things we, we read about, that it was really good. And, and so we kind of, there's a story that he refers to in there. And this story really is what stood out. And I want to tell you this story. Here, Andy Stanley is a pastor in, in, down in Georgia, and he was, uh, he and his son and some other people were on this trip, and they were in China. They went to an American leather factory for a tour. Just, but not, he wasn't going in as a pastor, we're just going in as just a normal person to, to tour this thing. And, and so the, um, the manager of the, the factory had said, you know what, I'll lead the tour myself. I'd like to take you around and show you everything. And so he did. And this was in China. I think I said that. But it was in China. And so they took, it around, took him around. And, and there was a, he, the manager had said, hey, would you mind if this young, there's this young woman that she, um, you know, she came, you know, started off working uh, as, you know, in a very low part of this company. Now she's a manager. Would you mind if she came along with us? It would be a great experience for her. And he was like, sure, come on. That's fine. No problem. They did. They Tour the thing, came back to the manager's office, and the manager said, hey, you know, well, do you guys have any questions? And, you know, obviously they're asking about the company, do, you know, what they did and what they saw. But the young woman, the young Chinese woman, she steps up and she says, I have a question. And she asks um, Pastor Stanley, and she says, um, she goes, I have a question. She said, um, she says, are you a pastor? And he said, uh, and he's, remember he commented in this, and he said, well, I wasn't sure in 2005 if I could be a pastor and be in China and not go to jail. But he said, yes, I am a pastor. And, and she goes, someone, about a year ago, someone gave me a CD, a message, a, a message that you spoke. I listened to it over and over and over again. And she says, as a result of that, I gave, Je- I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And she goes, once I, and so I love these words, once I was empty, but now I am full. And she went on talking about how that, you know, the next thing, she, she wanted to get into a church. She wanted to find a church, and she searched. She finally found probably, a, probably an illegal Bible study that was taking place. It was not registered by the state but that she would go to on and off when they did. And then there was a church that she found. It would take her two hours by bus to go to, but she said, you know what? I need to go to church. I need to be a part of that because I, I love Jesus, and, I want, I was, and he has filled me, so I want to be there. And so she would do that every Sunday. And she says, I have one more question, Mr., uh, Pastor Stanley. And he says, okay, sure. And, he said, and she says to him, she goes, I'm, I'm curious, why doesn't everybody in America go to church? <laughs> he said he didn't really have an answer for that one. <laughs> but in the course of that, he begins talking about it. That's where the book came from, about the fact of irresistible faith. Because sometimes what, the things that we do as the church, as the body of Christ, pushes people away. It's not presenting necessarily the real Jesus, but, but our version, and our, our rules and regulations and different things that repel people from wanting to know Christ. How can we as an individual, how can we as a church be irresistible in reaching out to the world around us? And that's what we're going to talk about in all the different areas of our life over the next few weeks. Amen? But today I've got to lay a foundation. And as I said, foundations are vital. They're not always pretty. No one ever says, man, that's a beautiful foundation on that building, right? You don't see it. It's under the ground. It's kind of a little bit of it sticking up out of it, but it's nothing pretty. And I mean, if you ever pass by a construction site, I mean, you know, like they're digging and digging and working and working. And every time you go by, you're like, I don't see anything. It looks the same as it did like three months ago, two months ago. Nothing's changed. What are they doing over there? When are they going to get this building done? 
right? You ever seen that before? It just seems like it's taken forever to do. And it's nothing, it's nothing beautiful. You don't comment on it. You don't, you don't say, man, that, that foundation, like I said, that foundation is gorgeous. Man, they're doing an amazing job. No, you, you, you say that when you see the windows and the building coming up and the doors and things. Man, that's beautiful. That's great. Look at that. But the foundation is vital. It's not always fun. It's not always like, wow, but it's vital. And this is kind of like that. I'm not saying this is not going to be fun and this is not going to be pretty, but I'm just saying this is the most important thing in building our life, having this irresistible faith within our lives. And it, I'm just going to have to back it all the way back to the very beginning, book of Genesis, and just kind of just stay with me for a few minutes as I kind of talk our way through as we kind of pull this to the point that we need to grab a hold of today. In the book of Genesis, you read the story about Adam and Eve, right? And so in that, we see that Adam and Eve have this personal relationship with God. God is in the presence. Adam is walking in the cool of the evening with God. I don't know about you, but that does not sound like he's very distant from them. That is like he's hanging out with them. Like literally, God is hanging out with Adam and Eve in the garden. Maybe they're eating some mangoes, which I couldn't do because that would kill me if I had a mango, but unless I had <laughs> Benadryl, but anyways. But, you know, other things. I mean, they're, they're, they're doing all kind of, you know, they're, they're hanging out together. Which is, a, a, to get the picture that God created Adam and Eve to, to have a relationship with them. And then, as we know how the story goes, because of their rebellion, they have to be banned from the garden. That relationship has been fractured. But I want us to always remember, when we talk about the fact of having a relationship with God, you want to see really how God wants that relation to be? Go back to the book of Genesis and look at Adam and Eve, because that's God's desire, is to have this relationship with you that is pure, this relationship that is beautiful, this relationship that he is there with you. You're having a tough day, guess what? You're not alone. And I know we say that, oh, I know, well, I know, I know God's with me. Sometimes it's so cliché. It's so in, it's no, it's, it doesn't have much power behind it. It's just kind of, eh, we just kind of say it. But do we really actually believe it? But the reality is that God wants us to really understand that his desire is to be with you. His desire is to be involved in every detail of our life. That it's not just like he's up there somewhere, way, way up there, kind of floating around. We just got this picture, you know, God's this, he's got this big, you know, gray beard and, you know, kind of just floating around looking at, no, I don't believe that. His presence, his spirit is here with you, surrounding you. In fact, he says, he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, as Jesus said. Just understand that, God, you are with me, that your spirit is with me. See, going back and looking at Adam and Eve in the garden before they sin, that is the picture that we got to really want. See, that's what he's working to restore, a relationship that are no barriers, a relationship that we are together with him. And so, and so here they're banished out of the, out of the garden, and, and so God wants to be in a relationship with us, so he chooses a family. He picks a guy by the name of Abram, and he says, Abram, hey, listen. And there's a whole bunch of stuff there, and this is kind of my version. I'm not, you know, there's scripture that talks about all these things, but we would be here for till next Sunday reading everything I'm going to talk about over all these things. We're not going to do that to you. But basically, he says, Abraham, he goes, I want to cut a covenant with you. I want to come into a partnership with you. And he says, I'm going to do this for you, and I need you to do this for me. And in this, that we will have a relationship. And he says, he says, I want to take your family and make it a blessing to every nation in this world, for every person on the face of the planet, their lives will have the potential to be touched and blessed as a result of this, this covenant relationship that we're in. In other words, because eventually, through that, through that covenant, through that time, Jesus comes along. God uses it as an opportunity because he's, he's so driven to come back into relationship. And see, you know, it's like Adam and Eve, they made a decision to step away from God. They made a decision to violate the word. And so now God's like, hey, now I need to come back into a covenant, a partnership, to come back into this, this, this to, to my creation, into man, mankind, so that we can have this relationship. And so we, we see through generations, that's kind of what happens. And so God's wanting to restore this personal relationship with us. And so we fast forward there, <clears throat> down the road, Abraham's family has multiplied. Joseph, if you go back there in the promise, you know, he's, he gets sold into slavery. And then all of Joseph, man, he's got a lot of, lot of descendants. Each, over that time, they multiplied and they multiplied and they multiplied in Egypt. 
Then the, the Pharaoh, if you know the story, the, you know, if you ever watched the story of the Ten Commandments, you kind of know the story, that the Pharaoh comes in and says, you know what, hey, we got all these people here. We want to make them slaves. And we're going to make them work for us. And then God brings Moses in, long story short, brings them out of Egypt and is leading them back to where they first started, back where Abraham was in the promised land that God gave Abraham. And in that journey now, they're heading back. They, they come out of Egypt. There's a whole bunch that happened there. But Moses brings them out and they come to the place called Sinai, this, this big mountain. God has a conversation with Moses Moses, God writes the Ten Commandments. There's a number of things that happen in there, but ultimately he has the Ten Commandments and these instructions from God to how to build what, is, what we would refer to as a, a tent of meeting or the tabernacle. Now, when we, we, we think about that, it was a, it, this, this tabernacle, this, this tent of meeting, it was a movable place of worship for the children of Israel, for God to connect there, for God to be able to meet with Moses and the people and to reveal his will, his will and his desire in their life to lead, to guide, and direct. So they have this, this tent, okay, which is quite interesting because they go, well, why would God, what would he want a tent for? Well, let's just see what happens. All right. So he has this tent that he sets up. Let's see if we can get it to work. All right, here we go. I don't think it looked like this. It didn't look like this. But for purposes today, to get a picture of what this tent was like, it was a, this tent, it was obviously a lot different, a lot bigger than this. But it was a place, as we said, where God met with them. As the Israelites lived in tents in the desert, so God, their king, would dwell in a tent in the midst of them. See, see the picture again, God wanting to come back into their family, back into relationship. No longer distant, way, way over there, but, but to be able to say, you know what, hey, you guys are intense. You're going, uh, leading and wandering all your way all the way to the promised land. He goes, you know what, I want to come. I want to set a tent up, and I want to be right there, right smack in the middle with you guys. Because God's desire is to be with you. Not to be distant from you, but to be with you. And so here he does, and this is all way before Jesus because it all changed with Jesus. But, but so this is God taking the steps to get back into this relationship with man. And so here he has, he's in this tent, and this tent is there, this tabernacle that is there. Obviously, as like I said, it doesn't look like this. They didn't have these pop-up tents that you can throw down like that. Total different picture, okay? But it's the same idea. It's a mobile place of worship for the children of Israel. For God is wherever they go, he's with them. He's not only there in, over the, the Ark of the Covenant, as the scripture talks about, but he led them by this, you know, by this cloud, by, what was it, a cloud by day and, a, and a, a pillar of fire by night to warmth and keep them protected. And so he wants them to know, guys, as you're going through all this, I want you to know I am with you. You know, we got to know if you say, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, I believe God, you know, and I know God is with me, but what is with the but? Get your butt out of there, not your butt, but the butt out of there. Move it out. It always gets in the way, doesn't it? It's like, come on. Well, but this, but that. You know, no, God, it's like there is no but involved in this. I am with you. Even if you don't feel it, even if it doesn't look like it, seem like it, feel like it, I am with you. And he wanted them to know it, and he wants us to know it today. That no matter where we are in life, when you're confronted with this situation, he is there. So I love what Jillian and, and, uh, and Andy said in that because it's like there are times we get into a place where we like, I don't know what to say to this person. Man, I've been there. I'm not going to try to sit there and say, oh, no, I'm a pastor. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And every, every time I speak, the words of God come flowing out of my mouth. Thank you. Hallelujah. 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 There's times, man, I don't know what to say to somebody. Sometimes I'm just like, God, how do I deal with this person? How do I, how do I tell them about you? You know, I was on this one, and it, it, you know, I've had the, many of the situations, and it's like you go back, and you're like, okay, sometimes you're able to, how do I share this irresistible faith? How do I make this irresistible? So this person that is like anti-Jesus, it's amazing, today you get a lot of people that, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a spiritual person, and I believe in God, but I just don't like the Jesus thing. You know that you can't have God without the Jesus thing, <laughs> He kind of comes with it. He is the way, the truth, and, the, and he, is the, he is the gate. That's what Jesus refers to, that he is the gate. God's over there. You want to get to him? This is, the, this is how you got to go. 
oh, no, no, I want to go that way. No, this is the way. This is, see, the arrow is pointing right there. This is the arrow. You got to go through there. See, the world wants to go all these different ways. And, you know, we have a lot of people that, that are really challenged with that. And so how do, you, how, do you, how do you talk to a person that doesn't want to talk about the Jesus thing, but they want to spiritualize it? I'm a spiritual. What does that mean? That could mean anything. That means that you have a plant at home that you worship. I don't know. Maybe you're worshiping your, your cat. You know, I don't know. Who knows? It's, it could be all kind of stuff. But Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And, but so God is in this, and he wants them to know, I am with you. Because in, in, and the interesting thing was that everywhere they went, what did they do? They took him with them. They kept going a little further, went around the mountain. There was times when they just missed it completely. They had to keep going. If, you look, if you've ever followed the path, if you have one of those uh, Bibles that's got like the path of the children of Israel going on their way to the promised land, you swear they're either high or drunk. Because they are going around and looping all over the place. It's like, guys, do you know where you're going? And each one of the things that they're going around is because they just didn't get it. It's, 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 God couldn't take them into the promised land with the messed up situation that they were in. He, you know, he wants to know, listen, I'm with you. And it's amazing. You, you, can be, you can go to church, you can say you're a Christian, but still not get your life in order. You can go through all the motions and still be missing the mark. And that's what they were doing. And God's like, listen, you can't cross those shores until we get this thing together. There's things that God wants to do in your life, but you know what? He can't do it because he doesn't want you to mess up where he's taking you. He's got to do this work in your life. And he's patient. One thing I found out, he's patient to deal with you. He's patient to deal with me. He'll just wait. He's got lots of time. <laughs> Sometimes I wish, God, you had a little bit shorter time. You know, I'm going to move things along a little quicker. I look back over the years, there's some things that just took me a little longer to learn, a little longer to get together. He didn't want me stepping into doing what I'm doing until I was ready to step in to do what he called me to do. And it doesn't mean that I knew everything when I stepped in. I most definitely did not know everything I was doing. I look back now, I'm like, wow, I don't even know if I would have come to the church at that time. <laughs> but thank God for his grace and some of those that endured. <laughs> but through, I know Renee Mel, you guys are like with me on that, man. How God worked in those things. You know, that's how all of us are. We look back and we see how God has, like, brought us so far. He's patient. He's enduring. He wants us to know he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And even with, even with the children of Israel, he said, I'm with you. In the midst of your rebellion, in the midst of your sin, I'm with you. And everywhere they took that tent, everywhere they took that ark of the covenant, it's so amazing. Every battle they went to, everywhere they went with that, God gave them the victory as long as they followed what he called them to do. They always had the victory. And something like that, when we understand that God is with us, he's in us, that I have the power and the presence of Almighty God. That's what Paul said, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me, that gives me what I need, that is about alive in my life, that's living and moving. And see, as long as I understand that he is in me, that wherever I go, I'm taking him with me. I don't leave a home without him. Amen? When I do that and understand that. See, why is this message of that he's with us never leave us nor forsake us because for us to have an irresistible faith that people look at and say man i want what they have how do they deal with that i want that how, how do they go through all those things i i, I need that how does it, you've got to know that you know that you know that god even when i don't feel like it you're with me even when it doesn't look like it's coming together you're still with me even when I don't know the words to say, you said that you'll give me the words to speak. So, God, I'm just going to take a step. That faith is going to be alive. You're going to lead. You're going to guide. You're going to direct me in every step that I take. Because God's desire is to always be with you and with me. Fast forward 300 years. We find a situation now, now that Israel has they, they've moved in. They're in the promised land. And in fact, God even told them back in Deuteronomy before they moved in. He said to this to them, Deuteronomy 17 14. When you enter the land of the Lord your God is giving you. And have taken possession of it and settle in it. Key word, settle. They got comfortable in their land. He says, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. So what happened, he says, he says there's going to be a point where you're going to be tempted. When you go through and all of a sudden you, kind of, you get where you are, you feel like you've kind of arrived, you settled, you've got comfortable, that you start looking around and saying, hmm, what's everybody else got around me that I don't have? And that's exactly what they did. They got settled in, and they began to look around. They're like, hey, 
And, and a little later on in 1 Samuel 5, 8, Samuel is, is one of the leaders there. And, and Samuel's getting old, and his children aren't really following. They're not, not really. They're not following in his footsteps at all. And so they kind of came up to him and said, you know what, uh, Samuel, we want you to retire. Samuel's feeling really rejected right now. You're kind of old. You don't got much time left. He says, so you know what, we want a king like everybody else has. And Samuel, he goes, he goes to God, and he's, he's wounded. He's upset. I mean, how would you feel if someone said, hey, you know, you're too old. We're going to retire you. <laughs> it's time for you to step aside. We want to do things a different way. That was basically what they're saying. And so God says to them, he says to Samuel, he actually, he comes in and he says, they said to him, now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. And the Lord told him, and so God speaks back to the Samuel, he says, Samuel, yeah, they're rejecting you, but he says, you know what, they've rejected me as, me as their king. They don't even, but in other words, they, they forgot that, that God was one leading them and guiding them through all that they went through, and now they're at a point saying, no, we don't want that. We want to be like everybody else. Listen, be, be careful in trying to be like everybody else. The Bible says that we're called to be a peculiar people. In other words, that doesn't mean a weird, flaky, crazy kind of, but, but something different. Christ in you is going to challenge people. Christ in you is, gonna, is not always going to, it's just not always going to fit you know, we were on a, yesterday I was on a college tour, one of the last ones, thank God, that we were on, and, uh, <laughs> and we're in this group, and it's amazing, you can kind of spot the, so there's something about it, you just, there's this couple that was there, and I, I, we, at the end we, we kind of got parted, and I wanted to go up and ask them, and just kind of, because they looked familiar in some, one degree, but, but I just knew that they had to be Christians, I mean, literally, if, if I had to, you know, I don't bet, but I'd say if I, if I did, I, I know I would, I would win because the fact was you just knew they were Christians, not because they had a big cross swinging around their neck. Every time they walked, it kind of swung. They weren't carrying a big old Bible. They weren't, every time the, the college, the leader said something, they were like, hallelujah. They didn't know. They didn't, they didn't say anything like that. But there was just something about them. And it was amazing in this group of like 20, 25 people that we end up in this group they're walking around with is that we just kept gravitating to each other talking to each other out of the blue. It was just, it was like we had, like Andrew and I, it was like we had known these people, you know, for a while. And at the end, I was going to, you know, I was going to wait till the end just, you know, and, and say, hey, I have a question. Do you guys, are you guys like believers? Are you, you know, guys just, and then we ended up getting, and I couldn't find them afterwards. And I, unfortunately, I should have jumped earlier on that. But, but I just knew it. I mean, be honest with you, it was just like you could feel there was something different about them. And that's what God says about you. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. priesthood. We'll read the scripture at the end today. But you're different. There's something about you that's different than everything else around you. You don't see it. All right? You may not know it. And I'm sure you probably don't. But you stand out to other people that don't know Jesus. Because the Jesus in you shines out of you even when you don't want Jesus to shine out of you. He does, because he's alive inside of you. Sometimes as much as you try to maybe try to hide it with the group that you're in, it's going to come out, because Jesus is going to seep out of you somehow, some way, somewhere else, and, and, and they're going to say, that, what, something's different about you. Oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm nothing different about me, you know, then you come out with one of your jokes or make something or say something, no, I'm not, you know, beep, 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 no, I'm not, hallelujah, woo -hoo. You know, No, you don't say hallelujah, you know, trying to cover, but Jesus in you shines out of you. But the, the, the problem came for Israel because they wanted to be like everybody else. It's, I know myself, I, we always, I always work to try to connect with people. I've always been that way. My family over the years always joked with me since I was young all the way up, but I've always kind of been, they, they kind of refer to me as Switzerland. I'm always, Switzerland's like the mediator, and I've always been the mediator. So I always take both sides of the story. I don't necessarily believe just one side of the story. I'd always look at both sides of the story. And I've done that with my kids. They're like, Dad, you know what? Oh, They're like, I'm like, no, I want you to see both sides. There's always two sides of a story, you know? I've learned that the hard way, I think. I said, you got to look at the whole picture, not just a piece or a portion of it. And, and so, but as, you know, so I have to really fight with that in my life because sometimes it's like you're trying to make peace. But the fact is this, it's like I have to say, wait a second, but Christ in me. He's got to shine in the mist. I, I can't make everybody happy. I, I can't try to be like everybody. Does that, do you understand what I'm saying? I'm just kind of getting off track of my, my, my notes here today. But, but to challenge you, it, Israel, they got into trouble when they began to 
and say, hey, God, we're going to push you and Samuel out because we want, we, we want, we want a king. So David, and so anyway, so we, we kind of fast forward a little bit. David is now king. And this is the next stage, what happens. This is what we want to get to as we close this out. David comes in, and, and now he's, at first it was King Saul, and Saul didn't work out because he kind of got off track. He got way off track. So, so now David, God appoints David to be king, and David is now David of Goliath, you know, fame. So it, it's David, he's king. And, and so David's kind of at a place where he's kind of settled too. He's kind of he's there. He's kind of arrived. And he looks around, and in verse 2 of 2 Samuel 7, he says to the prophet Nathan there, he says, hey, Nathan, Man, I, I've, been, I've been living in a palace made of cedar wood, but the ark of God is in a tent. God's over there in a tent. And here I am sitting in this beautiful palace made out of cedar wood. It's aromatic. Arom- I don't know how to say that word, but aromatic. Arom- it smells good. It smells good. And it's a beautiful, and it's, it's precious wood. And this is a great place. And God's over there in a tent because I want to build him a house. I want to build this up. And, and so, you know, he's saying this to, to Nathan. And, and so Nathan comes back and, and says to God, and God comes back to him and he says, listen, I, in verse 6, he says, I've never lived in a house from the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until this very day. I've always moved from one place to another with a tent and a tabernacle as my dwelling. In other words, it's not about, understand what he's saying. I'm not talking about, he's talking about the mobility of the people. I've always moved with the people. I'm not a place to go to. I'm a place that's going with you. He says, verse 7, Yet no matter where I have gone with the Israelites, I have never asked them, Why haven't you built me a beautiful cedar house? It's kind of God like saying, Do you really think I need a house? I don't want a house. I want a relationship. I want them to know that I'm with them. I'll never leave them. I'll never forsake them. David's son, Solomon, he goes on. He builds a, builds a house, beautiful temple. People from all over the world came. The ancient world came to see this. It's an amazing place. Beautiful architecture, beautiful wood, beautiful jewels and gold and silver and all these different things. And they stick God in the house. I'm kind of being a little dramatic with that. They didn't technically just grab God and stick him in the house. You know, he... He did fill the place, but that was not what... See, going back, God never wanted to be put in the house for people to go to visit him. He wanted to be mobile as a tent is mobile in their lives every day. Because after that, they all grew distant from God. In fact, Solomon totally messes it up. He marries all these foreign wives. He comes in and he brings all their idols and all their little... He builds little mini houses for all of them. Starts worshiping with all these, with, their, with his foreign wives. I mean, it's a mess. See, there's power in coming to and belonging to a church. I'm not anti church, obviously. <laughs> that would be kind of weird for me to be up here doing that. Because the Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. We come together, we worship together. There's something that happens in the synergy of the time, the place. We come together to worship God, or He's moving here. But it's this understanding that we see the church is a gathering of believers. The church is not a building. It's not a building. Oh, this place is, this is holy. No, it's really not. It's dedicated to God's service. But you know, this building is not holy. We could move out of this building and a construction company come in here and take up residence. I've had friends that they they started, they didn't have a church building, so they started meeting in a funeral home. I don't think they raised any dead in there, but they... (laughs) We're meeting there. And some people were so, oh, I'll never go, I'd go to church at a funeral home. Why? It's just a building. It's just a, the church is not a building. The church is the gathering of believers. They come together. The church building is a tool that's used to facilitate, to gather, to worship, and learn as the people of God come together. Thank God for it because you know why? It, it's, a, it's a place with air conditioning, hallelujah, when it's hot outside. It's a place with heat. It keeps us from getting wet when it rains and the wind blowing up, messing up that, that, those clothes and that nice dew you got going on and the hair and everything. Like that. It, 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 everything's looking good. It looks nice. But it's a building. Sometimes we sit there, oh, it's building's holy, bless God. And I'm not trying to be sacrilegious here. I'm just simply saying we need to get a better picture because what happens, wh- why am I saying with this? Because there's this a, this a big point of what I'm trying to say is. Some act like they're living in the Old Testament. 
you come here to meet God because you think this is where God lives. He doesn't live here. His address is not 2052 St. George's Avenue, Rahway, New Jersey. He doesn't live here. Okay, come on, kids, we're going to church to see God. God's not a circus. Amen? <laughs> He's not Cirque du Soleil, okay? He's not going to do a bunch of acrobatic things for you and entertain you. This is not where he lives. He doesn't live behind that, that, that cross up there in, the, in a room somewhere in the attic. No. When we make Jesus Christ Lord of our life, he lives in here. And when we come together, we come together with him in here, alive in here. And why is that important to know? Because many times we forget the fact that he's living and abiding in here. We say it, we hear it, it becomes so cliche, we go through the motions, we can never forget because if we're going to have an irresistible faith, we have to know it's not, it's not where I am where God is, that he's always with me. You're standing in the supermarket, guess what? You and God are standing in the supermarket line. When you go to the bank, you and God, you're like, God, can you put some money in my account? No, no, well, no, that's going to, you and God are at the, you and God are at the, at the bank. You and God are at school. You're at work. It's you and God together. You're there with him in that place. When you walk out that doors, we are the tent. Everywhere we go. Okay, God, here we go. We all come in because we're the tent. We have the presence of God living and abiding inside of us. See, to form the foundation of talking about irresistible faith, the first thing, first thing I've got to understand, that God is not a place that, that I, I'm not going to where he lives. He lives in me as a believer when I begin to understand that, it changes the way I think, it changes the way I talk, it changes the way I, I process things in, in my heart, my mind, and deal with people, because I realize that everywhere I go, he's there. When you got up this morning, guess what? He, he was right there in your room with you. When you got in the car, or when you walked here, guess what? He was right here with you. When you walked through those doors, guess what? He walked in there with you. I think if we got that in our mind a little bit better, we'd, we'd have a little bit more power and strength in our life that we're not alone. It also would keep us kind of think, hey, let's, let's take another thought and guess on whether we should say this or do this or act like this or however. Is that really how Christ would want us to be? If he's, if he's a part of us, if, if he's living in the inside of us. As the church, we're not to sit in here and hide, but to take this tent, us, out into the world. You know, we did that in, in, in I know that I got a, I, I, this is one of those messages, I, I got, I'll be done so early today. Whew, didn't happen first service, and I guess it's not going to We'll be done soon. Just hold on. You're going you're gonna to go eat lunch, brunch in a few moments, so you'll be good. But, you know, as a church, we made the decision years ago. We said, you know, we want to we take this tent out to the world, to our community. And so let's do a giant Easter egg hunt. This was kind of before, not kind of, it really was. We, we, see it, we saw another church that had done it out in another part of the country, and, and we said, you know what, let's, well, let's do that here. You know, there wasn't anybody else that I knew of that were doing it in our immediate vicinity. And, and so we said, let's do that. And so, and then I thought, well, you know what? If we're going to reach our community, I'm not trying to get all the Christians in. I, we want to we wanna reach the non-Christians, right? I mean, I mean, you guys are great, but hello, you know, it's like we're not trying to reach you. You're already in the family, you know? You want to reach the people outside of the family. And so we, we took, and I believe it was my sister that thought of the idea, and I was like, uh, and then I went along with it, but we did a giant blow-up Easter rabbit, Easter bunny, holding the basket and everything, pink, pink or purple, I forget, it was just bright, and stuck it in the front next to the sign advertising the Easter egg hunt that we were having here. Man, I got so much flack for that, in the church and outside the church. People were like, what is that? Well, you got that Easter bunny out there. What's the deal with that? You know, we're not, Easter's not about the rabbit. I know, but we're not, you already got Jesus. We're not trying to get you. <laughs> we're trying to get the ones that aren't. We're taking our tent to where people that don't know Jesus, that don't know the Jesus that you know. And you know what? And if I come in there, you know, with a big cross swinging around my neck and a big Bible, they're going to be like, I don't want to hear from you. So we stuck a rabbit out there. <laughs> Funny thing is, over the years, that rabbit brought a lot of people to Christ because he will use anything. If you, if you, if you know uh, Mary Collins, who leads up some of our teams, but definitely with the green room, she came to Jesus because of that rabbit. She would pass by here all the time going to work, and 
That she'd look in a rearview mirror to try to see what that is, and that rabbit's just looking at her, just kind of <laughs> bouncing around, <laughs> waving it. She, and she's like, I got to find out what that's all about. And she came in, and God met her. The rabbit didn't save her. Jesus saved her. The rabbit just waved at her. <laughs> got her to come on in. And, you know, as a result of that, so many of her family, she brought to Christ as a result of that. And we don't, pastor, put a rabbit, you know, I'm not, I mean, you know, whatever we've, it, we've used, it's just like, those were things that we said, God just kind of put in our heart, let's step out and do that. We, we did that this past Sunday. We, we took our tent, we took our lives, and we went in, and many of you, you went and you, you invited your family, your friends, and your neighbors to come and be a part of our Easter service last week. I mean, incredible. We... Last year we had just over, and it's not about, you say, well, pastor, it's not about the numbers. I look at it as about the numbers because every every number has a name and every name has a story. And God loves every single one of those people. So it is about the people that we can reach. But there's a, last year we had just a little over 1,300, something like that. You know that this Sunday we had 1,531 people that came to our Easter services on Sunday at the Union County Performing Arts Center? Man, I was... I was like, I hope they all don't show up on Sunday. We're going to be in big trouble, you know, because <laughs> we can't fit that in three services. But the opportunity, even if we never see a few hundred of those people again, the fact is that we have the opportunity to talk about the living hope of Jesus. And as a result of that, 110 people over those two services raised their hand and said, I want that living hope in Jesus. That is the most important thing. Amen. That was because we took our tent and we stepped out of our comfort zone and met people in a place where they may ne- would never walk into here, but they walked into that theater. Why does this matter to us? Because most of us are more comfortable with the temple idea. We come to church, hey, Jesus, good to see you. And we walk outside the temple, get in our car and go back to our or the life as we were before. Check, met Jesus today at church. Instead of the tent where we understand that we are to take God with us wherever we go. Into your work, into your home. Listen, and that's, that looks different for everything. I've, I've seen teachers that, I mean, that, that there's limitations. There's sometimes places you work, and stuff, there's limitations as to what you can do and say. But like I said about that, that family that we met yesterday, that I met yesterday, we were walking around that visit yesterday. There's just something infectious about them. And we just gravitated right together. And missed the, I mean, why them? Why couldn't it have been anyone else? But it was like right from day, right in the moment, phew, we just like started conversations and talking about things. It was just so natural. It was so family. People will see Christ in you when you understand that Christ is in you. That you are the tent that has his power and has his presence. Let me close with this verse, 1 Peter 2, 9. It says this, but you are God's chosen treasure. Priests who are kings, a spiritual nation set apart as God's devoted ones. He called you out of darkness to experience his marvelous light, and now he claims you as his very own. He did this so, this is the reason, he says, why did I do this? He did this so that you, who's you? That's me. That's you. He did this so that you would broadcast his glorious wonders throughout the world. He did this so that we, each and every one of us, would broadcast his glorious, his glorious uh, wonders throughout the world. See, that only happens when I understand that wherever I go, I'm the tent taking God to the nations, to my neighborhood, to my home, to my family. Would you stand with me? I want to pray with you guys. My prayer is this is that this week we have an opportunity, as we start this journey over the next few weeks, being, having irresistible faith, God begins to let us see and to know that he is with us, that there's a consciousness in every day that, God, you're with me, and I'm walking in your presence. You are leading and guiding every step, and that, God, you're putting people in my path so that I can let your glorious wonders be known in their life. Father, I thank you today. I thank you today, Father, that we just begin to see in a greater capacity, in a greater way, your love, your grace, your mercy. But, Father, that you are with us, that as we may, as Jesus Christ being Lord of our life, we have this power, the presence of of the Holy Spirit alive inside of us, that we are taking 
the, the message, this glorious, wondrous hopes of Christ, the living hope to the world around us. Let us see it. Let us know it. The Father, we're never alone that you're with us. That let us begin to grow into an irresistible faith. Father, in following you, but Father, one that is infectious to others to see that there's something about us. Father, that's just drawing life, your life into them. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.